This is Affluent Society 1950s Lecture 1, and I've chosen these two pictures because they show us consumerism as an important part of not only American life, but of international relations and international one-upsmanship, if you will, during the Cold War. In 1959, the U.S. and the Soviet Union exchanged national exhibitions, giving you know each nation's citizens kind of a chance to learn about life in the other nation. The Soviet exhibition in New York displayed factory machines, scientific advances, and other signs of the way that communism had modernized Russia, which had been a very underdeveloped country up until then. The, the American exhibition in Moscow displayed consumer goods, including stereos, movie theater, home appliances, and 22 cars, all to show the superiority of modern, modern capitalism and how it embodied political and economic freedoms. But the American exhibition's most important message was the conflation of consumption and freedom. In Moscow, Vice President Richard Nixon, who you see here on the left, the black and white picture on the left, celebrated America's high standard of living and its ability to create prosperity for all social classes. The Moscow exhibition, this is sort of this kitchen debate in a model kitchen you see there. Uh, which is an unscripted talk between Nixon and Khrushchev. Khrushchev is the baldy guy there uh, to, to Nixon's right. About And they, they debated, in quotation marks, about the relative merits of communism and, un, and capitalism. And they, all, they, they, they gave this talk in front of a modern suburban American kitchen. And Nixon claimed that the kitchen showed the mass enjoyment of freedom in America, freedom of choice among products, Colors, styles, prices, uh, all that kind of stuff. You see, Nixon understood that what we call soft power or the penetration of American goods in popular culture was stronger than military might. Okay. His celebration of American freedom defined as affluence and consumer choice within a traditional family life captured much about America in the 1950s. Now, Khrushchev, on the other hand, mocked American consumer, consumer culture and Americans' obsession with goods as both shallow and unproductive. Uh, but his prediction that the Soviet Union would soon surpass the United States in the production of consumer goods sort of admitted the fact that the, the United States had uh, uh, won the consumer goods war uh, during the battle during the Cold War anyway. Okay, so let me give you here a lecture preview of what we're going to talk about in these two lectures, the Golden Age, the Eisenhower era, the freedom movement, and the election of 1960. So if we were to have a focus question for the Golden Age, it would be what were the main characteristics of the affluent society of the 1950s? And the first thing I want to mention is moving to the suburbs. I think it's fair to say that a golden age of capitalism followed World War II. Remember what I said about World War II technological advances? Almost all of them had consumer applications. Okay, this led to economic expansion, stable prices, low unemployment, and rising standards of living in American life until really 1973. In every measurable way, most Americans, most Americans, not all, lived better than their parents had and better than their grandparents had. By 1960, a majority of Americans were defined by the government as middle class, and the poverty rate had dropped to one in five families. Innovations like television, air conditioners, dishwashers, cheap long-distance phone calls, and jet air travel came into widespread use. And former luxuries, things that had been luxuries before, like electricity and indoor plumbing, became common uh, in, in many American homes, most American homes. Further, if you take the 1950s broad, you know, the long 1950s, 1950 to 1973, the average real wages of manufacturing workers doubled and wages rose faster for low-income than high-income Americans, and that lessened economic inequality. So this model of widespread affluence was made possible by government policies, by a strong union movement, and by the country's global economic dominance in the wake of World War II. 
when the boom ended in 1973, it would be succeeded. Uh, it would be succeeded by uh, as it was succeed, succeeded by an even longer period of stagnant incomes for most Americans, which in, which increased inequality. And although the economies of Western Europe and Japan recovered after war, the United States remained the world's industrial superpower. Major industries like steel, automobiles, aircraft dominated the American and world markets. And like other wars, the Cold War increased industrial production and uh, redistributed population and resources. The West became a center of military technology and production, and the South housed military bases and shipyards. In New England, new aircraft and submarine production replaced some of the jobs lost by the movement of textiles to the South. But the 1950s were, in fact, the the last years of America's industrial age. Ever since, the U.S. economy has moved towards services, towards education, information, finance, entertainment, uh, while employment in manufacturing has dropped. Union-led wage uh, raises rises cause many employers to turn to uh, mechanizing production in order to reduce labor costs. The number of farms in the United States declined as well, even as new technologies in irrigation increased agricultural production. In agriculture is the sector where you see the mo- the biggest change and the biggest effect of industrialization and uh, technological cha- uh, produ- pr- te- technological improvement on the number of workers in agriculture. A single farmer can now do what uh, 100 field hands used to be able to do, uh, probably even more than that. Okay. Uh, changes in southern agriculture continue to reduce the number of agricultural laborers, three million of whom, three million of whom, both black and white, left the South. Through the labor of Latino and Filipino migrant laborers, once luxuries like apples and oranges became an everyday crop grown in Texas, Arizona, and especially in California. What most spurred economic growth in the 1950s was housing construction and spending on consumer goods. The post-war baby boom and population migration from cities to suburbs created a demand for housing, televisions, home appliances and cars that Nixon was highlighting in that kitchen debate. In the 1950s, the number of houses doubled, most of them built in suburbs. Many Americans now realize dreams of owning their own home by purchasing purchasing an inexpensive house in a housing development. Uh, Two uh, men named William and Alfred Levitt built the first Levitt town, right, which is sort of the first planned suburb. There had been suburbs before, and a lot of what we think of as part of this far cities now were sort of uh, were originally suburbs. But um, the Levitts built Levitts out on Long Island, and it soon it became the most they became the most famous suburban developers. Houses were affordable, assembled quickly from prefab parts, and this made them very desirable desirable for middle class Americans. Okay. But suburbs were often centered around malls, which were accessible only by cars and were used for shopping and other private activities, unlike city centers that had multiple uses. Here again is a picture of the kitchen debate, more of a close-up, and uh, you have here uh, the the American homemaker showing off a washing machine to... um, uh, Khrushchev mainly, Khrushchev and Nixon there in the foreground. Uh, Brezhnev, by the way, who became Soviet premier later, is just to Nixon's Nixon's left, just to the right in this picture here, looking off to the side. And Khrushchev is pointing at the, uh, at the uh, washing machine, asking questions. Uh, his interpreter is, is doing the same thing uh, to, to Khrushchev's right. And Nixon is listening to the homemaker give her answer about whatever the whatever the question was. Okay. Here's a graph showing the real gross domestic product per capita, 1790 to 2014. So from the beginning of the country till more or less now, and you see that uh, it really shoots up starting in the war years in the 1940s, but then goes through the roof in the 19 starts to go through the roof in the 1950s. 
This is Levittown. This is the most famous suburban community in the United States, photographed in 1954. Okay, uh, initially, all the houses were very, very similar. As I said, they were kid houses. Uh, they were made from prefab parts. The planning was very similar. What, what happened, though, of course, is over time, uh, homo homeowners would make individualized changes to their houses. So today, Levittown looks far less uniform than when it was built okay but the the the, the, the broad the wide streets the broad sidewalks the uh the tricycle there in the uh foreground the, the lawns everywhere you know lots of grass some homeowners are starting to plant um bushes and things like that this is the ideal of this is the the symbol of american suburbanization now for the longest time many social critic many, many social commentators and critics um bemoaned the suburbanization of the country because they said it led to bland uh, conformism and everyone was the same and and um uh it, it, it was unimaginative and it was uh, it was just uh, simply living off the the fat of the land but since then i think analysts and historians have had a more much more sophisticated analysis of suburban life because after all suburban life took a lot of people out of very unhealthy parts of cities. Um, it allowed for uh, an expansion. Of, you know, it was, it was much healthier. Uh, American sports for for kids grew dramatically during this period, and so there there is certainly a lot more to be said for suburbanization than if you read stuff from the from the fifties and sixties and even seventies. Uh, you you get a skewed view of of the effects of suburbanization. Now a lot of this class has been about the West. We use the West to help explain a lot of things in this period, and uh, it also helps explain a lot of things in this new golden age. California best symbolized the post-war suburban boom. Between World War II and 1975, more than 30 million Americans moved west of the west of the Mississippi River. One-fifth of the 1950s population growth happened in California, and in 1963, it surpassed New York as the most populous state. Okay, Sort of centerless western cities emerged, such as Phoenix, Houston, Los Angeles. They didn't really have downtowns like, you, like, like, like the eastern cities. These were decentralized clusters of single-family homes and businesses tied together by highways. Okay. Unlike eastern cities, cities that had central uh, central business districts and surrounding residential areas united by public transportation, okay. in the new suburbs, life revolved around the car. People drove to work, people drove to shop, and older city centers stagnated. Okay. Suburban homes required lawns so much so that today more land area. More land dairy in the United States is cultivated in grass than in actual agricultural crops. Affluence and consumerism had never before so pervaded American society. In consumer culture, freedom became the ability. Uh, the abil freedom, <laughs> sorry, became the uh, defined as the ability uh, the ability to satisfy market deciders. Right. Let me say that again because I'm stumbling over my words like crazy here. In, in a consumer culture, freedom becomes this ability to satisfy market desires. The 1950s was a culmination of a long-term trend in which consumerism replaced economic independence and democratic participation as central definitions of American freedom. Okay. America has now happily accumulated debt in order to maintain a consumer lifestyle. Consumer culture also demonstrated the superiority of the American way of life, superior to communism. And American goods like Coca-Cola were marketed to countries overseas as the Cold War's most powerful weapon. Okay. Here's Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is Ernest Haas, a very famous photographer, uh, took this picture in 1969 of Albuquerque, but it could have been taken in any one of these American communities, these centerless places I t uh, mentioned, like Houston. Uh, as cities spread out, strips consisting of motels, gas stations, and nationally franchised businesses became common. 
Okay. Meanwhile, again, as in older downtown business districts in in other cities stagnate. And you see, this is sort of a strip. This is not what we call a strip mall, but it's a strip of a bunch of retail outlets along a, a, uh, a big road, okay, here on the right. Very, very common in the West. TV became the most effective advertising medium in history. Okay, here's an advertisement for Ford, one of the biggest American corporations, and it's being filmed. The background evokes the idea of driving on the open road as a form of individual freedom. You see, uh, I don't know why the trunk of the car is open, but uh, that's probably why they're setting up the shot. They, they put this background image of clouds and the sun and a, and a long horizon to give you the impression that you're out the freedom of the open road. And... Most famously, something my parents would never let in the house, Swanson TV dinners. Okay, introduced in 1954, the frozen TV dinner was marketed in a package designed to look like a TV set. Now, not the, not the plate itself, but the actual box that contained it looked like a TV set. set. And, you know, it had these um, uh, separate categories. It looks like a, a cafeteria tray where you had your different items. And within a year, Swanson sold 25 million dinners. And although my parents, for instance, complained that they were unhealthy and they were cheap and their food wasn't very good, uh, uh, I'm, sure, I, I'm sure they wish they had inv invested in, in Swanson foods uh, when they were young. Okay, like, like I keep saying, I keep implying... TV and cars are really the big thing that it defined the 1950s in American life. Television especially spread the culture of middle-class life and consumerism. By 1960, almost all American families owned a TV set, and television replaced newspapers as the most common information source about public events. T TV became the nation's primary leisure activity. It changed Americans' habits and offered Americans of all backgrounds a common experience. TV, program, uh, TV programming almost always avoided controversy and depicted a humdrum middle-class existence. Early TV shows that featured urban working-class families uh, that, had, that had featured working-class families in the late 40s, early 50s were replaced by quiz shows, westerns, and comedy set in suburbia like Leave It to Beaver. So in other words, a show called The Honeymooners which was extremely popular in the late fifties and early uh, late forties and early fifties, um, which was about an, uh, an urban family, um, and uh, on which the Flintstones, among other things, is based, became supplanted by things like Leave It to Beaver. Okay. TV also became the most effective advertising medium ever, selling goods and spreading an image of the good life as one based on consumer goods. And, of course, buying a new car seemed essential to freedom. And along with the home and the TV, it became a consumer necessity for each family. By 1960, four out of every five families in the United States owned at least one car. And they're all, made, all, all those cars were made in the United States, or practically all of them. Okay? There were some fancy foreign jobs, but those were held by very few people. Auto manufacturers and oil companies became the top companies in America. Detroit became the center of the auto industry, supporting enormous factories with 40,000 or more employees. Uh, the, Red, the, the River Rouge complex had 62,000 employees in the car industry. The car transformed American life. The interstate highway system changed Americans' traveling habits, enabling long-distance vacations by car. The result was an altered landscape of motels, drive-ins, the, 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 um, the appearance of the strip mall for the first time, movie theaters, roadside restaurants, including fast food enterprises like McDonald's. That opened in Illinois in 1954. So the, the car really is it was an icon of American freedom representing individual mobility and private choice. Now here's a picture of a family watching television in 1948. Okay, so this is still when uh, 
the uh, television was kind of new. Now, uh, by the way, television quickly surpassed movies and live theater as the country's major form of entertainment. Now, there are a lot of uh, things going on in this picture. The first of all is you what you what you need to know, especially for your generation, is um, the early televisions were built into things that look like furniture. I mean, things that look like sideboards or or servers or things like that, so or cabinets. So you see, you can see, maybe you can see in this picture that this this TV has doors. Uh, the TV set, the TV uh, uh, console, right, as a whole, this has doors, so you can close it when when you're not watching it, right. It, it, it modern TV is certainly hanging on the wall. And modern TVs where you where the TV itself is out there with all, in all its technological glory, sort of bare bones and everything, would have seemed really odd and uh, space age to 1950s people, 40s, 50s people. So it was very much they they were big p for pieces of furniture and big pieces of furniture. Okay, that you could again that again uh, close off uh, if you wanted. Now average TV viewing goes up dramatically. Uh, by the way, th this doesn't look very dramatic because it's only two additional two hours. But remember, there are only 24 hours a day and there are only, t you know, whatever it is, 12 hours in a, or, or 16 hours in a, a waking life. So four hours and 36 minutes of TV watching in 1950 is a hell of a lot. And then it continues up to, to practically six hours by 1970 and God knows what it is now. Between 1956 and 1993, the interstate highway system dramatically altered the landscape of, uh, of the United States and America's daily lives. It made possible more rapid travel by car and stimulated the, uh, the growth of suburbs and small towns, even along many of its routes. Okay? This is a map of the extent of the uh, interstate highway system by uh, 1993. No, sorry. By 1963, yeah, it was. It took forever to be completed, but it, but this is but it, but this is the this was the the backbones of it, the backbone of it. And like so many things, gender and race change in this period, and and perhaps most importantly for our purposes, gender and race in this period help tell us a lot about what's going on in the country. Suburbanization reinforced the family as the center of the quote American way of life and, and the center of women's household roles. Most women who had industrial jobs during the war lost them after the war and most women who worked outside the home remained in low paying non-union jobs rather than better paid factory jobs. Um, Although the number of women at work slowly rose, more women worked to supplement their family's consumer lifestyle than worked for economic independence. And their pay in 1960 was, on average, 60% of a man's pay. So they paid 40% less. It was widely assumed that the suburban family's breadwinner should be male while the wife stayed at home. Popular culture depicted marriage as the most important goal of the American woman, and women married younger, divorced less often, and had more children. Okay, divorce during the war actually goes up, believe it or not. Some people rush into marriage before the war uh, and, and then have to get out of it. A baby boom lasted from the end of the war, 46, to the mid-1960s, 1964, contributing to an increase of 30 million in the nation's population in the 1950s, 30 million. Further, medical advances like the availability of penicillin aided Americans into living longer than ever before. And the family became a weapon in the Cold War as government officials argued that women's confinement to the home separated the free world from the communist world. Women worked in factories in the communist world. Feminism seemed to have the feminism as a political ide ideology and movement seemed to have disappeared from American life and culture. The idea of domestic life as a as a woman's sphere had a long history in the U.S., but in, in the post-war suburbs, it came close to complete 
realization. Okay. The suburbs offered the dream of home ownership and security to millions of Americans who had suffered through depression and war. It also promoted Americanization as ethnic Americans left urban enclaves and joined an America of mass consumption. But the suburbs were racially segregated. Although they differed in many ways, suburbs were almost always white. As late as the 1990s, nearly 90% of suburban whites lived in communities with non-white populations of less than 1%. The racial segregation of suburbanization was the result of decisions by government, real estate developers, banks, and residents. We call this redlining in um, um, in uh, urban in in uh, sort of uh, social history. In the post-war housing boom, government officials insured mortgages. Uh, government officials ensured that mortgages were barred from non-whites, and when this was declared unconstitutional, didn't really matter because private banks and developers just continued the practice. Okay, now here's a graph of the baby boom. You can see that this really is a, a dramatic increase. 1945 was the, 1946 was the really big year. Everybody comes home from the war, and you know what happens. And then it booms really through the late 50s and early 60s. I think the baby boom generation is, is too broadly defined. It, people claim it goes on until 1964, and I just think that's, that, that also means that I'm in the baby boom, which is, I don't think I am, but um, I and my brother are both in it. Um, I think really the baby boom sort of should should start to be defined only as, as stop, stopping in, in 1960. Okay, but that's because I don't like to be called a boomer and I don't like to be thought of as so old. This is a maternity ward. Jack Gould, famous photographer, took this in 1946 of a maternity ward capturing the first year of the post-war baby boom. Advertisers in the 1950s sought to convey the, the idea that women would find happiness in their roles as, uh, as a uh, suburban housewife. Okay, and this is an advertisement for a May, Maytag washer, right? And, 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 it's, you know, it's this glorious uh, uh, happiness you see in the woman that, that they're trying to convey the message of. Now, this is more like a reality, right? This is the, the, the busy suburban mother. This is Elliot Irwin, his photographer. Uh, it's a picture of a young mother in New Rochelle, which was a suburb of New York City, and... Um, Shows that suburban life, suburban life for a, a woman and a homemaker could be far less idyllic than the advertisements uh, implied. Okay, three kids at least to deal with, having to, um, um, you know, one-handedly uh, make dinner is 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 very very difficult. Okay, now, so excluding minorities, this tract is exclusive and restricted. Okay, and that means it's exclusive and restricted to white people. Okay, and suburban builders sometimes openly advertise the fact that their communities excluded minorities. This photograph was taken in Southern California in 1948. We expect to see this um, in the South. We don't necessarily expect to see this in, in California. Okay, like I said, this is all part of redlining. This is all part of that exclusion of uh, minorities from, from suburban life. Now, housing in the golden age. Although Congress in 1949 passed a law to build more than 800,000 units of public housing, the law set a very low ceiling on residents' income in order to limit competition uh, for the construction of middle-class housing on behalf of private contractors. The terms of the law limited housing projects to the very poor, although the, with the fact that white urban and suburban neighborhoods, um, sorry, along with the fact that white urban and suburban neighborhoods opposed the construction of public housing, this re reinforced the uh, poverty of urban areas to non-whites. Urban renewal 
also demolished poor neighborhoods and city centers in order to develop shopping centers, all white middle class, um, sorry, all white middle income residential areas and state university campuses. Okay. Whites who were displaced by urban renewal often moved to the suburbs, but non-whites were unable to live, uh, to, to uh, leave the inner city and went to worse and worse neighborhoods in, the, in city centers. Suburbanization reinforced racial divisions in the United States. Between 1950 and 1970, about 7 million whites left cities for suburbs, while 3 million blacks moved from the south to the north, which expanded and created urban ghettos. Half a million Puerto Ricans, many of them small farmers and laborers, pushed off the land by sugar companies, moved to the mainland, and many settled in East Harlem in New York City. By the 1960s, more Puerto Ricans lived in New York City than in San Juan, which was the island's capital. Racial exclusion reinforced um, itself. Right? Non-whites facing economic you know, discrimination and exclusion from educational opportunities were confined to unskilled jobs. And as whites and industrial jobs moved out of the cities, poor blacks and Latinos stayed in the urban ghettos and these, these places became seen as centers of crime, poverty, and welfare. Suburban whites feared that any non-white presence in their neighborhood would lower their quality of life and lower their property values, and so residential segregation was reinforced by a tactic called block busting. Okay? This is a tactic that real estate brokers circulated exaggerated warnings of an influx of non-whites to persuade white residents to sell their homes quickly. Suburban home ownership remained a white entitlement with, with racial barriers in housing and therefore public education and jobs reinforced. While many of these issues would spawn protest in the 1960s, to many observers in the 1950s, it seemed that the ills of American society had been solved. If problems remained, right, their solutions were only required technical adjustments, not structural change or aggressive uh, political intervention. And here we have a picture of an East Harlem Elementary School, students at an East Harlem Elementary School in 1947. Most are recent immigrants from Puerto Rico, although some are probably of the, uh, some probably are of the area's older Italian American community. Now we also need to talk about religion and consumer capitalism. Both Protestant and Roman Catholic leaders spread anti-communism and Cold War culture in which the nation's religiosity was celebrated. During the 1950s, a majority of Americans, the highest percentage in American history, were affiliated with a church or synagogue. In 1954, Congress added the words, under God, to the Pledge of Allegiance. And in 1957, in God We Trust, was added to paper money. Hollywood movies like the Ten Commandments celebrated early Judaism and Christianity. Religious leaders used radio and television to spread the messages to uh, millions. And uh, the, the, these messages, these, even though they were religious messages, they were heavily imbued with anti-communism. So religious differences now seemed absorbed into a common Judeo-Christian heritage with Catholics, Protestants and Jews all shared history and values and contributed to American society. And freedom of religion was held to differentiate America from the anti-religious Soviet Union. Although the Judeo-Christian concept obscured the long-standing history of religious strife in, in the United States, it reflected the decline of anti-Catholicism and anti-Semitism in the United States and the increasing secularization of the nation. Because although a majority of Americans were affiliated with the church or synagogue, religion had more to do with personal identity, group assimilation, and promoting traditional morality than with any spiritual activity. The Cold War's Cold War freedom's economic content became the centered became centered on consumer capitalism or free enterprise, an economic system based on private ownership united the nations of the free world more 
than political democracy or freedom of speech. Even President Truman replaced the mention of freedom from want and fear in his speeches uh, with, with, the, with the phrase freedom of enterprise. The selling of free enterprise became a major industry that involved advertising, school programs, newspaper editorials, and civic activities. Yet talk of the virtue of free markets ignored how government policies like federal tax subsidies, mortgage guarantees, infrastructure construction, military contracts, and the GI bills all, all were all government programs, and they all spurred post-war economic growth. Now, this is an image from a booklet issued by the American Economic Foundation, which illustrated the linkage of anti-communism and religious faith during the Cold War. The hairy hand in the bottom half of the drawing represents the communist threat which endangers religious freedom in the United States. This, uh, these immortal chaplains, is a stamp, postage stamp, to depict four chaplains who perished during the sinking of an American ship during World War II. Okay. In its original design listed their don domina denominations, Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish, but when the stamp was issued in 1948, the words were omitted, which was in keeping with the emphasis on the newly invented idea of Judeo-Christian tradition shared by all Americans. Okay. This is a portrait of affluence. This is a, a photograph by Alex Henderson uh, 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 and... Uh, Sorry, this is a, a, a photograph by Alex Henderson and um, shows uh, an employee of the DuPont Corporation posing with his family and the food they consumed in a, consumed in a single year, 1951. The family spent $1,300, around $12,000 in today's money, on food, including 699 bottles of milk, 578 pounds of meat, and 131 dozen eggs. Nowhere else in the world was fo a food so available and inexpensive. And now I want to get back to more domestic politics and talk about the Eisenhower eras. And if we want to have a focus question for this period, we'll call it what were, what, how were the 1950s a period of consensus in both domestic policies and religious affairs? Eisenhower's election, Eisenhower's election in 1952 is extremely important. Dwight D. Eisenhower, known as Ike, was the most popular, popular military leader to emerge from World War II. Okay. Ike had supported Truman, candid, Truman's candidacy for president in 1948, and in 1952, both parties wanted Eisenhower as their candidate. But Eisenhower saw that there was the, the contender for the Republican nomination, a severe right-winger named Robert Taft of Ohio, was a danger, and, he, and Eisenhower thought that, that Taft would turn America back to isolationism and away from moderation. So Eisenhower jumped in the, the race on the Republican side and gained the Republican nomination. He chose as his running mate as sort of a, 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 a bone to throw to the right wing, he chose his running mate, Richard Nixon of California, who, as a member of the House on American Activities Committee, had achieved, achieved notoriety through his anti-communism, anti-communist activism, particularly against Alger Hiss. Nixon won a Senate, Senate seat in 1950 by suggesting that his Democratic opponent was uh, sympathized with communism, said she was pink down to her underwear, and thus Nixon gained the reputation for opportunism and dishonesty but he was also a very skillful politician who led efforts to change the Republican Party's image from a defender of business to a champion of, quote, the forgotten man. That is, the hardworking citizen burdened by heavy taxes and government bureaucracy. Using populist language to promote free market economics, Nixon helped lay the foundation for the triumph of conservatism a generation later. Now, as soon as he got the vice presidential nomination, Nixon ran into trouble, and Eisenhower almost dropped him off the ticket, which was a very big thing to do. You don't do that. You don't contemplate doing that for any reason. Um, uh, because Nixon had been uh, given a dog named Checkers, uh, and the, there was question about this, whether this was corrupt, uh, and and it was really, really kind of a, a, 
a silly controversy, but what, 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 what Nixon did was he went on television in his famous check, checker speech to convince Americans that the family dog was the only gift he had received uh, as, a, as a politician, and they wasn't returning it. Very, very, very effective speech saying, my kids love the dog, I'm not giving it back, right? And um, that sort of direct counterblast was worked very well. The speech rescued Nixon's career and illustrated the change that TV was making in the political process. The 1952 presidential campaign was the first to show how television changed politics. Candidates crafted images that were directly projected in, into Americans' um, living rooms. Eisenhower's popularity dominated the election, however, and public frustration with the Korean War, along with Eisenhower's pledge to bring peace, won him an overwhelming victory over Adlai Stevenson, the Democratic candidate. Four years later, Eisenhower beat Stevenson again by an even larger margin, but the Republicans did not gain power in Congress, and in 1954, Democrats regained control of Congress and held it for the rest of the 1950s. Significantly, Eisenhower made, made, made major inroads into the Democratic South, but Democrats continued to control almost all Southern states and local offices until the mid-60s. Now here is a picture of Eisenhower at a presidential stop in Baltimore, 1952. I like Ike. We like Ike. This is a poster for Adlai Stevenson, which, among other things, was... Uh, was uh, really old-fashioned compared to the I like I sort of thing. It was uh, it, it, it contrasted the Republicans as the party of Hoover with bread lines, homelessness, and banks closed, and the Democrats, the party of Roosevelt, with higher wages, better homes, and Social Security. And here's the presidential election, which, of course, as you see, Eisenhower sweeps. This is a landslide, 442 electoral votes to 89, right? We don't generally have these kinds of landslides anymore. I think the last one was 70, well, the last one was 84, right, before you were born. Um, but this is a, this shows a major shift. Uh, this shows how, how dominant the Eisenhower message was. And we'll take up more of this and Eisenhower's actual presidency in the next lecture.